Okay, greetings. Uh, my name is Michael Gillette. I'm a AP U.S. History teacher at Burning Champion High School in Burning, Texas. Uh, this is my uh, uh, presentation over the crisis of union, the impending war in politics. Uh, today, in this, this video, we're going to analyze the issue of slavery in the territories as a uh, an issue, a political issue that helped precipitate um, sectionalism and the impending war uh, between the North and the South. Um, so, uh, the war the, to the Civil War, um, the following resources were used to help create this presentation. Um, the Battle Cry of Freedom from James McPherson and America, a Narrative History, uh, authored by Tyndall and Shee. So, the issue of slavery in the territories, um, it, this, is, this issue will, will ultimately piggyback off the Mexican, the, the Manifest Destiny Unit uh, and APUSH. Uh, just want to simply build off that and, and the springboard into uh, the Road to the Civil War Unit. Uh, with the issue of slavery in the territories, John C. Calhoun and Ralph Waldo Emerson, two guys that really had very little in common with each other, um, both sensed in the war a, a, a certain amount of danger, um, omens of, of a greater disaster. Calhoun said that, quote, that Mexico was the forbidden fruit and that the penalty of eating it would to be subject our institutions to political death. Emerson, the romantic transcendentalist, said that the United States will indeed conquer Mexico, but it will be as the man who swallows the arsenic Mexico will poison us. And he went on to make, the, make, make a statement that is quite prophetic, and that is that wars have a way of breeding new wars. And so, uh, so without a doubt, the, in, amongst American historians, the Mexican-American War is considered to be one of the most important causes of the Civil War because it gives us the issue of slavery in the territories. 1848, upon the conclusion of the war and the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, the United States uh, will add for, for $15 million Mexican uh, territory called the Mexican Cession. And the, this is a land that, um, I mean, this was part of the, the goal of uh, southern, southern politicians as they really pushed for war with Mexico. They hoped that a war with Mexico would yield millions of acres of land upon which uh, potential slave states could be created. Now, as the Treaty of, Gu Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo is being debated, uh, a Pennsylvania Democrat by the name of David Wilmot, who is a freshman member of Congress, a, a, a politician who uh, favored expansion, uh, he supported the annexation of Texas as a slave state. He creates a lot of drama and a lot of division uh, after the war and proposing what is called the Wilmot Proviso. And he believed that if free, the, if free soil should be acquired for Mexico, that, quote, God forbid that we should be the means of planting the institution upon it. He believed in the Northwest model. He believed that uh, in the old Northwest Ordinance of 1787, the Northwest Ordinance established uh, all land north of the Ohio River as free territory. And so he believed that, uh, as the founders did in 1787 with the Northwest Ordinance, 
The same should be done with the Mexican cession, that, that slavery should be forbidden from the, from the territory. He says in land, uh, the proviso stated that land acquired from Mexico, quote, neither slavery nor indentured servitude shall ever exist in any part of said territory. The Wilmot Proviso will be successful in politicizing slavery once and for all. You know, you think of the steps that American politicians took to avoid the slavery issue, uh, it is not going to succeed anymore. Um, and so the Proviso was voted on over 40 times between 1847 and 1849 never garnering enough support to pass both houses. So the, this is obviously the, the country um, uh, prior to the 1845 annexation of Texas. And so the premise is, uh, as, as stated, that all, according to the, the uh, Northwest Ordinance, that all land north of the Ohio River would be free territory uh, the 1820 Missouri Compromise admitted Missouri as a slave state, while Maine is entered as a free state in order to promote that sectional balance. And then they drew the, according to the Compromise, Henry Clay establishes the 3630 line of latitude, which uh, all land south uh, of 3630 would be subject to terror, uh, slavery, and all land north in the remaining Louisiana territory would be closed to slavery. And so <clears throat> obviously with uh, the addition of Texas as a slave state, 1845, uh, I think because of its relation to 3630, it was a no brainer that it would, it would be a slave state. Plus at the time Texas was added to the union, there was already slavery in Texas. Now, as we take 3630 and we extend that line across the country, across the continent, um, it was an expectation upon Southerners that as, as Western expansion occurred, that slavery expand, especially, and according to James K. Polk, uh, should expand across the country, uh, that that line should, should uh, in spirit, uh, provide um, I have a blueprint as to where slavery should go. Now, Calhoun, in response to uh, David Wilmot, argued that since the territories were common possession of the states, that Congress had no right to prevent any citizen from taking their slaves into them. And to do so would be violate the Fifth Amendment, which forbade Congress uh, to deprive any citizen of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And so uh, what Calhoun's position is, is that Slavery is protected uh, under the Constitution, uh, and that uh, the Fifth Amendment protects private property rights, and the government cannot make a law that deprives citizens of their life, liberty, or property without due process, without due process. And so um, that's exactly what, uh, if Wilmot, the Wilmot Proviso is enacted, that's exactly what it would do according to Calhoun. And so he linked the guarantee of slavery and the Bill of Rights into a guarantee of slavery. So uh, that uh, the, the right to own slaves is protected um, by the Bill of Rights. He says if the North insisted on ramming through the Wilmot Proviso, the result would be political revolution, anarchy, and civil war. So the Compromise position uh, between Wilmot and Calhoun is going to be uh, popular sovereignty. Uh, Polk, of course, at the time, as I mentioned before, uh, favored extending the 3630 line all the way to the Pacific as an as a easy way to resolve the, the, this, this sectional debate over the issue of, of whether or not slavery extends into the territories. Uh, and Lewis Cass, uh, Senator Lewis Cass of uh, Michigan is going to suggest that maybe perhaps that citizens of a territory, uh, that the people living in these Western territories ultimately get to decide uh, the fate of whether or not slavery is going to, whether their territory is going to be slave or free. So this, pro this approach would thus remove the issue out of the national arena 
and put it into the hands of those directly affected. And of course, we call this concept, it's called popular sovereignty, or uh, another term would be squatter sovereignty. But for the purposes of uh, my APUSH class, let's 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 look at a uh, using the terminology popular sovereignty. Popular sovereignty again is considered to be the compromise position between um, between um, Wilmot and Calhoun. Without directly challenging slaveholders' access to new lands, popular sovereignty promised to open open them up quickly to free farmers who would almost surely dominate the territories. Popular sovereignty, they hoped, might check the magnetic pull towards the opposite poles of Wilmot and Calhoun. And so uh, it's, it, I think it's important to understand that with, uh, with Calhoun and, and uh, oh, excuse me, with uh, Senator Cass, he believed that popular sovereignty was actually a pro-Northern policy. He, he felt like that at the end of the day, Western territories are mostly going to be dominated by free white farmers um, and so ultimately he, he did not see uh, any any um, controversy in the issue of popular sovereignty now put, approved a measure allowing Oregon to organize without slavery um, but really didn't but postponed the decision as to what would happen in the southwest I think the key point is here is that there was not a sectional fight as to the future of Oregon that's whether or not Oregon would be free or slave Okay, um, it was assumed that it would be free, and so there. But the, where the friction comes in is the fate of the southwestern territories acquired from the Mexican War. Now, um, what? Of course, 1848 is not only of the a president uh, and having accomplished all of his goals. Uh, James K. Polk serves only one term. Uh, his Democratic successor uh, on the ticket um, is Lewis Cass, the author of Popular Sovereignty. Uh, Zachary, Ta Zachary Taylor, uh, the hero of the Mexican War, um, he's going to win the election for the Whigs. Now, it's important to understand uh, exactly who Zachary Taylor is. And there you can see the, uh, the electoral map, and you, you really do not see... Uh, a, a sectional uh, political divide in the election map yet. Uh, I think as we get closer to 1860, you will see that uh, you will see that develop. Uh, but Zachary Taylor, uh, interesting point about Zachary Taylor. Zachary Taylor is um, the war hero of a very unpopular war. Even though the United States uh, easily wins the war, um, the war is extremely unpopular, especially in the North. And so uh, he is a Whig, and the Whig Party is, is and really, I think, an important uh, development that, that every student should uh, acknowledge and be familiar with is the idea that the Whig Party during this period is going to die. Um, it's, on its, it's, it's, it's beginning to fade. It is a national party. Uh, made up of northern and southern Whigs. Um, and the glue that held this Whig party together was the hatred of Andrew Jackson. Uh, Jacksonian politics, you know, his, his bank war and the, and the nullification crisis. And, you know, it's those, those issues really helped to unite opposition to Jackson in the form of a, a, a Whig party. Well, by, by 1848, that, that glue that is holding together the Whig Party is beginning to come apart. And um, 1852 will be the last time that uh, the Whigs will actually run a, a serious challenge um, uh, in, in a presidential election uh, against the Democrats. But Zachary Taylor divides the, the Whig Party, the Northern and Southern Whigs, over the issue of slavery. I mean... Uh, ultimately, Zachary Taylor is, uh, he's a Southerner, he's from Louisiana, he is a, a, a slave owner in Louisiana, and he's the war hero of a very unpopular war. Um, if you recall, during the Mexican War, uh, Northern Whigs try many times to defund the war. They vote against the war. They see the war 
as, a, as part of a, a Southern plot to expand uh, slavery to the West from uh, acquired Mexican territories. Another thing about Zachary Taylor uh, that I think is important is he is uh, not really a politician per se. In fact, you can make the argument most uh, American political historians, uh, presidential historians will point to Zachary Taylor as perhaps the uh, to be president. Um, he had very little political skill um, to do the job. Um, so he, uh, in fact, the first election he ever voted in uh, was his own. So he wasn't much of a, a politician um, and was kind of ill-equipped to handle the rigors of the job. Um, now, what we do see in 1848 is we see the development of a third party movement. Now, this third party is, is extremely important because this party it will eventually morph into what we call the Republican Party, the party of Abraham Lincoln, um, party of Abraham Lincoln. Then this is the, the Free Soilers, okay, the Free Soil Coalition. 1848, uh, a new political force is uh, um will emerge. Um, it is largely made up of three uh, groups. Uh, one would be rebellious Democrats, what historians call the New York barn burners. These were the political supporters of Martin Van Buren. And, and if you recall, Martin Van Buren was uh, uh, Jackson's uh, secretary of state and vice president. And eventually his heir uh, was elected president in 1836 only to see his presidency sabotaged by the Panic of 1837. Uh, but Martin Van Buren um, is going to bolt the Democratic Party. And when he leaves the Democratic Party, he is going to bring with him his supporters. Uh, his barn burner backers proclaimed bondage, talking about slavery, uh, quote, a great moral, social, and political evil, a relic of barbarism, which must necessarily be swept away in the progress of Christian civilization. And so uh, one of the big developments is as the Whig party is beginning to unravel, uh, what's taking its place is this uh, Northern party called the Republican party. And uh, the Free Soil Coalition is the backbone of this, of what this new uh, major party in the North. And it was made up of disgruntled Northern Democrats who quit the Democratic Party because of the slavery issue, because the Southern Democrats are uh, ex uh, uh, aggressively seeking to expand uh, the institution of slavery across the continent. And uh, so these these New York barn burners, or these, these Democrats begin to uh, quit the party to join the free soil movement. And of course, uh, anti-slavery Whigs, Northern Whigs, uh, what we call conscious Whigs. Um, these are your anti-slavery Northern Whigs who reject Taylor uh, in 1848. And uh, so these anti-slavery Whigs are going to quit the party and they, they are going to join the free soil coalition. Now, Northern Whigs, if you look in the North, the Northern Whigs could actually be divided into two groups. Uh, you've got your conscious wigs, and those are your anti-slavery wigs, uh, versus your cotton wigs. And the cotton wigs were basically your northern businessmen uh, and southern planters. These are the wigs that were supportive of slavery, that were pro-slavery because of it, the economic um, necessity of slaves. And then, of course, the 1840-1844 abolitionist third party, the Liberty Party. Liberty Party will disband and its uh, leaders, uh, its its members, will also join up with the Free Soil Coalition. But really, who were the Free Soilers? Uh, as a party, as a political movement, they really didn't care much about abolitionism. What they were really, the, 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 the glue that holds all these groups together is their idea that free soil should be for white farmers, that Western territories should be settled by independent white farmers and not masters and slaves. Uh, they believed that they, you know, they didn't really, the Free Soil Party did not set out to destroy slavery. They just wanted to keep blacks in the South where they belonged, rather in the West. And so free soil 
rather than abolitionism became the rallying cry. In 1848, like I said, the, the candidate uh, uh, who ran under the third party uh, was Martin Van Buren. His running mate was Charles Francis Adams, the, the uh, grandson of John and Abigail Adams, the son of John Quincy. The Free Soilers made slavery the campaign central issue. Um, they forced both parties to address the issue. The Democrats distributed two types of campaign biographies. Okay. Um, in the South, okay, Cass opposed the Wilmot Proviso, uh, positive aspects of popular sovereignty. The North, popular sovereignty was considered to be the best way to keep slavery out of the territories. And so the, the Democrats, when they campaign, their message is different, okay? So when, when Democrats in the South campaign for Cass, they say, hey, let's vote for this Michigan guy because he, like us, he doesn't like the, the Wilmot Proviso. And and uh, they they did their best to try to spin the, the positive aspects of popular sovereignty. In the North, uh, Northern Democrats um, campaigned for Cass, saying that, hey, you know, the best way to keep slavery out of the territories so they tried to. Um, now the Whigs benefited in the fact that their candidate Zachary Taylor lacked a political record. Uh, in the North, Whigs pointed to Taylor's pledge not to veto uh, legislation um, when it comes to whatever Congress decides about slavery in the territories. And in the South, Southern Whigs are going to. Uh, Push for Taylor's candidacy. He's going to, they're going to push for Taylor, uh, you know, because of his reputation as a war hero, his status as a large slave owner, and a sugar and cotton planter. So during the 1850s, the American political system became incapable of containing the sectional dispute between North and South that had smoldered for more than half a century. One major political party, the Whigs, will collapse, and another, the Democrats will ultimately split into northern and southern factions, which we will get to uh, when we discuss the uh, Kansas-Nebraska Act. And so here's uh, campaign literature. Uh, this is obviously a, a, a poster uh, promoting the Free Soil Party, the Martin Van Buren and Charles Adams. You find in the literature Free soil party literature, it says free soil, free labor, free speech. Okay, and so, um, you know, the free labor comes from this, this ideology that uh, one liberty that people should have is the ability to work for whomever they want. Uh, to, that, that one of the freedoms we have in this country is we get to work for whomever we want to work for. And, and slavery actually uh, does not allow for that. And so really what the Civil War is going to be fought between, it's going to be fought between people who promote slave labor versus those that promote free labor. And so that was also a, an important component of the free soil movement. Um, but in the, in the literature, uh, in their campaign literature, you often see an independent white, white farmer farming, working out, working the fields alone by himself, okay, without without the help and assistance of slaves. And you can see it here as well. You can still see uh, the same image there. Uh, that kind of became the image of the party, that the, the West should exist, um, should only be settled by independent white farmers. So, we are going to stop right here. Uh, my next video in, in this series will uh, cover the Compromise of 1850. Thank you.